Hi everybody and welcome to lecture four, which doesn't have a clean separation really between parts A and B as much as some other lectures will, but I'll still be dividing it in half just so that the videos don't run too long. And in lecture three, I introduced some basic facts of Earth's climate, beginning with solar radiation, the greenhouse effect, and the structure of Earth's atmosphere. We learned about how the ozone layer exists in the stratosphere and how the Antarctic ozone hole exists because of ozone depletion. And we also talked about how air, how solar radiation drives air circulation throughout the world. And we began to get a little bit into what the consequences are for Antarctica. We will be heading from that into a, okay, the volume is working. We will head from that into a short overview of the modern climate of Antarctica. And we will then begin talking about ocean circulation and the role that ocean circulation plays in regulating Antarctica's climate. So we'll start with talking about surface ocean circulation. We'll also have time to talk about how deep ocean circulation cycles water from the uppermost levels of the ocean to the bottom and, and how much of that actually occurs around Antarctica and how Antarctica functions to regulate what is known as thermohaline circulation or deep water circulation throughout the world. And Part of what I want you to think about is that this is Antarctica's modern climate, and Antarctica has not always been this way, which is something we'll talk more about in the geology unit. We'll end lecture four today with a little bit of information about paleoclimatology and how scientists obtain information about past climates, which is actually really the main topic of the, artic the article one that I assigned about the circumpolar current. And I'll actually, I will take some time to break that article down a bit in lecture today. So remember that your first lab is due on Friday, April 9th. And in addition, the first lecture quiz will open next week on Monday, April 12th, and it will be open until Sunday, April 18th. So it will largely cover lectures two through four. So it won't cover any material released next week. So you will want to make sure that you've reviewed lectures two through four, and you'll also want to read the climate articles and watch the assigned clip of Frozen Planet. Not as many questions will directly focus on those, but the short answer questions, at least one of them on the quiz likely will. And I'll be having a, and lecture three, as well as the review session slides from Monday, April 5th, have some discussion questions that could help you think about those articles and give you a sense of what I might ask. And I'll be having a review session in office hours on Monday, April 12th, that will largely go over the material that is going to be on the quiz. And I'll also talk about the format and give you more examples of questions you could expect to see. I also wanted to mention that two graduate students from our very own department will be talking about their research on Thursday, April 8th at two o'clock PM. And both of their projects are related to the sound properties of volcanic eruptions. And if you attend this talk, you can write a single paper um, you can maybe do it, do different paragraphs, but you don't have to write 400 words on each. You can just do one 400 word write up on the single talk since this is basically going to be two shorter talks in the same session. And the information to get into the Zoom session is up here. And I also emailed this out. Um, in general, um, I'm free to provide information, but the flyer has, the flyer will have the password and the Zoom ID um, if you are stumped. Now, I wanted to start off with talking one of oops, talking about one of the articles, which is which outlines how Lake Vostok, which is already a very cold location, it's um, a, a reminder that Vostok Station is the current Russian base, and it's located above a subglacial lake called Lake Vostok that is quite a long ways from Antarctica's coast, so it's in the cold, dry interior of the continent. Um, outside of being one of the coldest average places in Antarctica. It's also where the coldest temperature ever in Antarctica, as well as on planet Earth, was recorded. And this article talks, this article delves into the circumstances that led that to happen a little bit. And it appears that the extreme cold had to do with a combination of circumstances that produced especially extreme weather. Normally, relatively warm air from the Southern Ocean flows at least a little bit up onto the Antarctic Plateau or the glacier. And in winter 1983, there was a strong flow of air near Vostok that blocked this warm air and isolated the station and formed a bit of a gyre, a circular pattern around the station. At the same time, there was also very little cloud cover. And clouds actually help to trap heat in a sense because they reflect some radiation back to Earth. So a lot more heat than usual escaped out to space. So this produced extreme weather. 
due largely to a change in airflow. And it's an interesting little demonstration of how changes in atmospheric circulation or ocean circulation can create significant temperature changes. And so this article is, it's an older one, but I wanted to include it because I think the big freeze at Lake Vostok is cool and also it, no pun intended there. And it's also a good example of an article you could use for assignment number one. Testing microphone, still behaving, good. So returning to course content, what have we learned about Antarctica and its climate? In the geography section, we learned that Antarctica is really cold, dry, and windy, and we began to learn about why during lecture three. Latitude makes a big difference. Not only is Antarctica at a latitude where sunlight, even during the summer, is very spread out because it's hitting the land at an angle, especially compared to the equator, Atmospheric circulation also plays, oh, actually, and also regarding the latitude, um, the poles are most heavily affected by the tilt of Earth's axis because the poles get essentially complete darkness for part of the year. And so that creates especially cold winters in Antarctica because so much of it's in darkness. So latitude plays a strong role. And in a sense, latitude and solar radiation also play a separate role in air circulation. Because remember that air circulation is ultimately driven by solar energy. More solar energy is reaching the equator. Air circulation ultimately is transferring some of that energy to the poles. But it also produces a situation in which you have relatively cold and dry air falling at the poles. Yes, some energy is being transferred by that air, but overall, that air is very cold and dry. Antarctica is what is known as a high pressure zone because air is falling at the pole. And so that contributes really to why Antarctica is so dry and why it's so windy. And what happens then is that the air spreads out from the South Pole as what are known as catabatic winds, pressure winds that descend the polar plateau towards the coasts. And the Southern Ocean is extremely windy because winds can move in an unbroken loop around Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. And speaking of the fact that Antarctica has unbroken sea around it, that has led to the formation of a surface current, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, that helps isolate Antarctica from warm currents that could bring warmth to Antarctica. And another aspect is albedo, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Antarctica is covered in ice and ice reflects light and that helps keep Antarctica cold. So today we will learn about ocean circulation and how, and how ocean circulation keeps Antarctica cold. And we'll talk about some of the consequences of the ice cover in Antarctica. And something we'll come back to is that Antarctica hasn't always been this cold, extremely windy and dry and borderline uninhabitable wasteland. A beautiful wasteland, but it is a wasteland. Very little can live on the Antarctic continent itself which is something I'll return to during the biology unit because we'll learn that the marine biodiversity of Antarctica is still considerable, but the land biodiversity of Antarctica is very low. Very little of what lives in Antarctica actually really lives and feeds on the land. Antarctica truly would not be as much like this if it were not as isolated from other continents because the isolation is what has allowed the circumpolar current to develop and something hinted in the scientific article that I had you read is that the glaciers began to form after the formation of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. Now speaking of the glaciers, the glaciers have very high albedo. And albedo is a term that you might have come across before in discussions of global warming. Albedo is from the Latin root alba, and that's the same root that gives us the term albinism when humans or other animals have, have very little pigment in their skin. And it means white or light colored. Something that has high albedo is going to be white or light colored because white and light colored substances reflect more light than darker colored substances. So something with high albedo like, is going to be like a mirror. It's going to reflect back a lot more of the radiation. And it's also going to reflect a wider variety of wavelengths of light. And so generalizing about Earth's surface, the oceans and most land surfaces, such as those covered by grasslands and forests, have 
relatively low albedo. Dark colored surfaces are actually going to absorb a pretty wide range of the wavelengths that we see in the radiation that reaches Earth's surface. And the oceans in particular absorb a lot of the absorb a lot of um, a lot of incoming radiation. You can see in this diagram that only about 10% of the radiation that reaches a spot of open water is reflected, whereas then 90% is absorbed, which actually translates to the oceans absorbing a lot of energy. And something I mentioned before is that the ocean water doesn't, the ocean water has high heat capacity. It can absorb a lot of energy without changing temperature all that much. And that's one way in which the oceans actually help regulate Earth's temperature, of course. Um, as more radiation starts to reach Earth as a result, as more radiation gets trapped in Earth's system as a result of global warming, the oceans are going to heat up quite a bit because there's only so much they can take before the temperatures start to rise noticeably. Now, if you look at ice, in contrast, about some, somewhere close to 85 or 90% of the light is reflected. So the ice cover, um, as well as deserts, lighter colored desert surfaces tend to have high albedo. And as you might guess, the amount of ice present on Earth at any given time is going to actually affect how much radiation the Earth is going to observe, uh, absorb versus how much it reflects. And when ice caps are present on Earth, they keep Earth colder by reflecting light that would otherwise be absorbed by the oceans or land. And yes, there are indeed times in Earth's history when there has been virtually no pack ice at all, which we'll learn more about in the Earth History Unit. Now, in Antarctica, the ice formed in the first place because Earth's climate got colder and the formation of these ice caps accelerated as the Antarctic circumpolar current cut off the continent from the rest of the world. And the ice forming actually contributed to Antarctica as well as the world as on the whole becoming colder in an example of what is known as a positive feedback loop. And positive feedback is something we'll return to when we talk about climate change and it has nothing to do with benefit. It simply means that something like ice formation happens. So ice formation occurs because it's cold. And then when the ice forms, the ice reflects more radiation than otherwise would have been reflected because you have ice, which is, has high albedo replacing land cover or sea cover or the ocean, which has low albedo. And so more radiation gets reflected and earth gets even colder. And so as soon as ice was present in Antarctica, a positive feedback loop began, and that contributed to Earth entering what is the Earth's present ice age. Remember that even though we often think of the ice age as being a couple thousand years ago, we are still technically in that same ice age, just in what's known as an interglacial period where there's not as much ice, because there are still ice caps present at all. And so the Antarctic ice sheets and the East Antarctic ice sheet in particular, because it's so big, play an important role in regulating the climate of the earth and overall keeping earth relatively cool compared to the climate during, for example, the age of dinosaurs. Antarctica as a continent has 80% albedo. On average, the earth has 30% albedo and actually earth's average would be lower if it were not for the Antarctic ice sheet. And the Arctic does contribute as well because you have a glacier covering Greenland as well as sea ice in the ocean. but a lot more of the Arctic Ocean is, but some of the Arctic Ocean is still exposed as seawater for part of the year. And there's also a lot more land surrounding the Arctic that isn't glaciated. Antarctica is so heavily covered by glaciers that it plays a really, really outsized role in regulating Earth's climate. Now, moving from albedo to the Coriolis effect, which is something I spoke about during lecture three, I'd like to do another review of it because it comes up a number of times and because it is something people struggle with. Let's see where I can put myself where I won't be in the way. Here we go. So the Coriolis effect results from the fact that different latitudes spin at different rates. If you look at the diagram on the left, the lower left, you can see that the arrows at the equator are bigger than those close to the poles. And that's meant to illustrate scale or it's meant to illustrate how fast different latitudes are rotating. And latitudes closer to the equator spin faster than those closer to the poles. This is kind of a bizarre consequence of Earth being a sphere-like object. All points along the same line of longitude, the horizontal, excuse me, the vertical lines, are going to be at the same time. All points along the same longitude, one of the lines that runs from the pole, the North Pole, through the equator to the South Pole. If 
all points along that line are going to face the sun directly once a day at the same time. And that is solar noon, basically when you're directly facing the sun. 24 hours after solar noon on a given day, all points along that line of longitude will once again be directly facing the sun. Now, if somebody is standing on that line of longitude near the equator, they are standing on a part of the Earth that has a lot farther to go in 24 hours in order to get back to solar noon at that exact same time of day because the Earth is wider at the equator. Meanwhile, somebody standing close to the South Pole on that exact same line of longitude, in contrast, has much less far to go in 24 hours. So simply put, the Earth spins faster at the equator. Now, an inertial force is one related to conservation of the energy you start out with, in one sense. And the Coriolis effect is an inertial force. It is negligible below a certain velocity, but for relatively fast moving bodies like winds, airplanes, projectiles, and currents of water, it has a noticeable effect. And an object taking off from the equator, such as a plane that is heading towards one of the poles, has two dimensions of velocity that we need to think about, not counting whether the object is high or low in the atmosphere. There's the velocity that we think about, the north-south velocity, aka how fast a plane or wind or a massive wind is traveling from the equator to the pole. But there's a velocity that we don't really think about because we don't notice ourselves spinning with the Earth, because from our perspective, it's happen happening quite slowly. As we stand or sit, as I sit here in California, I am rotating with the Earth at the same rate that the land at the latitude where California is, is spinning. I am slowly spinning without really noticing it. Now, the Coriolis effect comes into play when objects or masses move fast enough between different latitudes. Because as, an, because as say, an airplane heads towards the pole, it actually maintains the spinning velocity it had at the equator. Earth is spinning less and less fast from left to right as you are moving, as you move from away from the equator. But you are continuing to spin in that direction as if you were still at the equator because the momentum is conserved. Basically, a massive wind or an airplane behaves as if it were still rotating at the speed that you have at the equator. Even though you're traveling as you move towards either of the poles, you're traveling over latitudes that are spinning progressively slower. And thus, you end up basically going too fast. You end up being taken too far to the east because Earth is rotating west to east. You can correct for this, and people flying airplanes have to do this, but as we'll see on the next slide, masses of air aren't sentient, and so they can't correct They can't correct for themselves, and they end up being deflected. Meanwhile, if you're going from the pole to the equator, this causes you to go too slow, essentially, compared to the ground that you're flying over, and you are dragged to the west if you don't correct for it, because the Earth underneath you is spinning faster than than you are. You're, because you started at the pole, you are spinning with the velocity that you started at when you were at the pole, and the Earth underneath you is spinning faster. Now, regardless of whether you're in the northern or southern hemisphere, Earth is going to be spinning from left to right or from west to east. Now, you have to be careful with terms like left and right, because the difference in how the Coriolis effect behaves in the northern and southern hemispheres is a result of the fact that Earth is rotating from west to east no matter what, but you, you have this mirror situation where you have the equator, and then to the north of the equator, you get slower, and then to the south of the equator, the latitudes also get slower. So if you're in the northern hemisphere, relative to you and your original path, if you are, say, a pilot of a plane and you forgot to correct for the Coriolis effect, the path you will actually end up on is going to be to the right of the one that you were intending. And notice, so these red lines that I put in here are meant to illustrate what your intended movement is, as well as how you would move if there, if Earth were not spinning, if there were no Coriolis effect. Going towards the, going towards the pole, you intend to do this, but since Earth is spinning in this direction, you end up being deflected here, to the right of the original direction. If you're going from the pole to the equator, it's the same thing happening. You are again being deflected to the right of your intended direction. In the southern hemisphere, in contrast, Earth again is still spinning from west to east. If you head from the equator towards the south pole, you get dragged in this direction 
And notice that the original arrow is pointing this way. This is to the left from the perspective of the starting line. Whereas this deflection that occurs if you're going from the pole to the equator is also to the left of the intended direction. And that's why you have to be very careful with terms like left and right. You have to make sure that you're taking the viewpoint of whatever object is being deflected. And the Coriolis effect has a significant effect on air masses, both at the surface of Earth and in the upper atmosphere. So air masses end up being curved as they travel from one latitude to another. And the diagram on the left, which shows the movement of the air throughout the various Hadley, Farrell, and Polar cells, shows that this deflection is occurring both in the upper atmosphere and at Earth's surface. And ultimately, masses of air do travel from one latitude to another, but they don't do so in a straight line. Air masses don't have any way to correct for the Coriolis effect, and this produces curved patterns. And this is why winds, although they are ultimately carrying energy from either the equator to the North Pole in the Northern Hemisphere, or from the equator to the South Pole in the Southern Hemisphere, are also often referred to as westerly or northeasterly winds because they're usually not traveling in a straight North or South direction due to the Coriolis effect. And one thing to consider that will become important for lab next week is that terms like westerly winds actually refer to the direction that the wind is coming from. So for example, in the Hadley cell in the Southern Hemisphere, directly next to the equator, the surface portion of the wind circulation is traveling from the Southeast to the Northwest. And so it is referred to as a Southeasterly wind. And this is one of the trade winds, which is known as such because the winds traveling towards the equator are traveling fast because they have a lot of energy from the sun. And they're referred to as trade winds because when wind-based ship navigation was the most important before engines had been developed really, these were the latitudes where you moved fastest and they could take and sailors could take advantage of these intense winds. However, the ironic thing is that at the equator itself, the Coriolis effect deflects air masses from quite reaching the equator. They're always being curved just slightly away from the equator before they rise up. This means that there is essentially no surface wind when you're traveling along the equator itself and you get what are known as the doldrums. And if you look at this diagram on the upper right, you can see that the Coriolis effect is causing deflection of air whether you're at the surface or whether you're up in the atmosphere. And this shows two separate example, examples, a low pressure zone where you have air rising and producing what's known as a cyclone and a high pressure situation where you have air falling and spinning and producing what's known as an anticyclone. And in Antarctica, where we have the air mass falling around the South Pole, we have an anticyclone. We have a spinning descending mass of cold air. And the air that reaches the South Pole is very cold and very dry. It's colder, it's colder than the high pressure area you would have falling at 30 degrees because the weak polar sun heats the air in Antarctica so inefficiently. And the infrared radiation from Earth is less of a factor because the air is falling on an ice cap. Remember that the ice caps are somewhat like domes, especially in East Antarctica, where you have the really intense buildup of ice. And when the air falls at the South Pole, it begins to descend down the dome, gaining speed as it does. And this produces what are known as catabatic winds or drainage winds or pressure winds. These drain air from the interior of the continents to the coast, and they are by and large responsible for the intense windiness of the continent. They become especially windy, they, they, the speeds get, get increased near the coasts where they start to flow through valleys and be trapped by mountains, and that can cause wind tunnels that cause the already fast moving winds to go even faster. And in places like the dry valleys, they can actually blow snow away so that it doesn't really accumulate and you end up with a handful of dry valleys. The dry valleys are indeed actually some of the windiest places in Antarctica. I can attest to that from personal experience. Something you see here is that when we talk about oceanic circulation, these winds coming off the Antarctic ice sheet actually play a strong role in bringing about deep ocean circulation. They push sea ice away from the ice shelf 
or the extension of the glacier and create a small area of open water known as a polynia where new sea ice can form. And we'll talk about that in the second half of this lecture. Now, with ocean circulation, as we transition from air circulation to ocean circulation, we have to make an important distinction between circulation that occurs at the ocean surface and that that involves the vertical circulation of water from the upper parts of the ocean to the deep parts of the ocean. The winds, which are driven by solar radiation, also drive the movement of the water at the surface of Earth's oceans. They generate surface currents like the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which isn't really labeled as such here, but is the current moving around all of Antarctica, as well as other currents like the Gulf Stream, a warm water current which carries warm water from the equator um, to the east coast of the United States. Um, and you'll notice actually something about the Arctic versus the Antarctic is that you actually have more warm water currents actually getting to the Arctic than you have any warm water currents reaching the Antarctic. There is not an Arctic circumpolar current that systematically isolates the Arctic Ocean from um, inflow of warm water, especially that inflow of warm water from the North Atlantic. So that's actually one big reason why Antarctica is colder than the Arctic. Now, a different form of circulation that I'll talk more about in the second half of the lecture involves the very slow circulation of water from the surface of the ocean to its depths and then back up again. And something I mentioned when we talked about the layers of the atmosphere is that layers of different density don't mix very well at all. In general, the ocean has layers of highly different densities that don't mix well, but a very slow circulation pattern of water from the surface to the depth does occur and that water actually moves out, moves throughout the world as this happens. It turns out that some important steps to the global conveyor belt of deep water circulation actually happen around Antarctica. Now, starting with surface circulation, we need to start thinking about the Coriolis effect right away, unfortunately, and also how physics and friction make it so that the wind, which by the way, has already previously experienced deflection from the Coriolis effect, will blow in one direction but cause the water to move in a completely different direction. This will be a bit confusing, but I'm happy to walk you all through this if needed. We learned last class that winds are driven by the Coriolis force, and this is why surface winds curve as they travel from zones of high pressure across Earth's surface to zones of low pressure where air is rising. Now, Again, when we talk about ocean currents, we are going to assume that the Coriolis effect has already deflected the wind. So we don't need to do a separate, we don't need to do a separate consideration. The wind on here is whatever direction the wind is actually moving in. This wind has not been deflected by the, this, we don't have to, we don't have to perform another deflection. But when the wind comes in contact with the water, there is another deflection that we have to consider. When the wind comes in contact with the water, it brings about friction. And because the, because the air has friction with the water, that causes the, that causes the, that causes the water to not be dragged at the exact same speed as the wind. And it also causes, it also, the Coriolis effect also causes it to be deflected relative to the wind direction masses of water are also affected by the Coriolis effect. Remember that things at Earth's surface are indeed affected by the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect causes the surface of the water to be deflected around 45 degrees relative to the original direction. And that's going to be 45 degrees to the right in the Northern hemisphere and um, 45 degrees to the left in the Southern hemisphere. However, something that happens because you have different layers of water is that the wind only really drags the surface of the water and the surface particles actually drag the water molecules underneath them, which drag the molecules underneath them, which drag the molecules underneath them and so on and so forth until about hundred meters depth. However, these drags don't all happen at the exact same direction or at the same rate, because as you might have thought of, the top surface of the water, when it causes movement of the water below it, the Coriolis effect actually has a deflection effect on the second layer of water relative to the top layer of water. And this is what is known as Ekman transport, a process that causes wind traveling north in the northern hemisphere to produce an overall surface current that is going to be traveling east 
as in other words, 90 degrees to the right of the original direction. Meanwhile, wind traveling south in the southern hemisphere is going to produce a surface current of water that will also travel to the east, and that is to the left of the original direction from the vantage point of the original wind direction. So understanding Ekman spirals relies on you thinking about the layers of water being individual layers, kind of like cards being shuffled. Because the wind will cause the surface layer to be deflected a bit, and actually the wind will have the strongest effect at the surface because as it turns out, the force is kind of dissipated as you move down in the water. So the strongest deflection is going to happen to the surface water. You're going to have the surface current, the surface water is going to be deflected to about 45 degrees um, relative to the original wind direction. Now, the surface layer's molecules will drag on the molecules in the layer below a bit, and that will cause them to be deflected even further because the Coriolis effect because the Coriolis effect is deflecting them to the right of the direction of the, or it's deflecting them relative to the direction of the top layer of water. Something I want you to look at is that these arrows, kind of like with the, how the arrows in the spinning earth showed that different latitudes were spinning at, at big speeds where you have large arrows or at small speeds where you have smaller arrows, this is showing you that a lot of water is moving at the surface, less is moving, less is moving in the second layer. And you can see that um, this isn't, this is in Northern Hemisphere example here in the main picture. So this shows you that the surface current is deflected about 45 degrees to the right of the original wind direction. And then the, this second layer of water isn't deflected quite 45 degrees, but it is still deflected a bit to the right of this top layer. A bit less strongly though, because the energy is dissipated by friction, by the fact that the energy isn't felt as strongly below. And you'll see then the third layer of water here is again to the right of the second layer, but a bit, the, but the deflection is less intense than the deflection at the surface between the original wind and the surface layer. And you'll notice this happens. They, the spiral forms from each, subse each successive lower layer of water being deflected a bit to the right of the movement of the layer of water underneath it, but less so and with less intensity. Now, what scientists do is they take an average. They use a they they use they use a computer to average the direction and take into account the intensity of the water movement. And overall, this produces a net movement of water 90 degrees to 90 degrees deflected from the original wind direction. In other words, in the northern hemisphere, the wind is moving in a particular direction. And this process, Ekman transport, causes the water overall to be moving 90 degrees to the right. In the southern he hemisphere, this would all occur 90 degrees to the left of the wind direction as a result of the Coriolis effect. This only really affects the top 100 meters of water because below that, the wind doesn't really have much power to drive the ocean water. And again, it's not quite as simple as this. Not every water molecule is going to move in that exact same direction, but overall, the water is going to be moved 90 degrees relative to the orig original wind direction. And this actually has the function of wind sort of driving water in circles in a lot of situations. Something that happens as a result of Ekman transport is that water gets piled up in some parts of the oceans known as gyres. And one example of that is actually the area of ocean where the Great Pacific garbage patch is. And it's not that easily noticeable to people, but Ekman transport actually causes a gradient. It causes part of the, it causes there to be areas of the ocean that have higher pressure where there's more water and lower pressure where there's less water. And ocean water will actually flow on a gradient from where the pressure is higher to where the pressure is lower, the same way that wind will flow from high pressure latitudes to low pressure latitudes. And in some cases, this process known as geostrophic flow produces what is known as a gyre. And this often happens in an area where you have wind patterns on 
either side of the area that becomes a gyre, creating a circular pattern, causing water to get trapped inside of it without ever really being able to completely reach the center, but sort of spinning around eternally in the same way that you have wind spinning around the eye of a hurricane. And the water will pile up in the center of this gyre because it has a hard time escaping. It has a hard time getting past the strong current on the outside, and it doesn't easily sink into the ocean because there's a strong density difference between the surface water and the deep water, which I will talk more about in the second half of this lecture. This can result in the water becoming trapped, and it can also result in whatever is caught in the water becoming trapped. In the North Pacific, what's happening is that you have um, Ekman transport is causing water to be driven in this direction, in to the to the east, um, in the north, in the northern part, and to the west, down here, and. This, the, and what happens is that the water is funneled into here, but it doesn't escape very easily. It doesn't escape this gyre, this, this rotating gyre of water very easily. Now you have a lot of garbage ending up in the Pacific from industrial pollution in Asia and North America, as well as elsewhere, but those, but those continents are nearest. And the garbage, especially the bits of plastic that get, get moved along with the water, get trapped in the center of the gyre along with the water. And this produces this produces the feature known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, an area where the water gets trapped in the middle of the gyre, and the plastic and other trash carried along by the water gets trapped in the center of it, and it doesn't really have an easy way to escape. It doesn't sink, and it just sits there and gets stuck in the stomachs of living organisms and traps sea turtles and does other wonderful stuff. In a slightly less destructive context, the Antarctic circumpolar current is essentially a large gyre. It's formed as a result of the Coriolis effect, wind and friction, um, causing Ekman transport. Um, and the fact that there is an open passage around the entire continent. You have winds. Um, something I want to consider is that, something I want you to consider is that you have winds sort of coming from sort of coming from the northwest and they get deflected even more um they get deflected a bit and also ekman transport causes the water overall to flow in a bit more of a bit more of an easterly direction you'll notice that that's to the left of the original wind direction because we're in the southern hemisphere and the same is true over here you can actually see that the the winds are coming. The winds are kind of coming from the um, the winds here are coming from the west, and they're getting deflected, and they're causing the ocean to be deflected a bit more due west. And the combined force of the winds overall causes water to flow in an unbroken loop around Antarctica. Essentially, the winds really don't ever quite reach Antarctica. They don't. They get deflected, and the water gets deflected along with it. And remember that the air moving at the equator also looks like it's approaching the equator always, but it never quite reaches it. This current that would um, not only does this affect the wind, but it affects the current itself. The current never quite reaches Antarctica. It gets deflected away from the coast iteratively, rolling around the continent, but never actually quite reaching it. And it's able to do this as fast as it does. The Antarctic circumpolar current is quite fast because there is essentially nothing interrupting its flow. However, there is a narrow point here in the Drake Passage where the narrowness actually causes the water to be channeled in there and to flow even faster. And the Drake Passage is the point at which the Antarctic circumpolar current flows fastest. And this has not always been the case in geologic time. At other points in geologic time, Antarctica has been attached to some of these continents. It's been attached to Australia, to South America, and Africa at different points in its history. It was most recently attached to Australia. Africa broke off from the continent sometime in the Jurassic period, which I'll talk about in the paleontology unit. The circumpolar current is the only current that travels all around the world. I will say that at such a high latitude, it doesn't have quite as far to travel as it would if, say, there was a 
circum um, an entire a tr a current traveling around the world um, through a water passage at the equator, but it's still pretty impressive that it goes as far as it does. Now for article number one, the scientific academic article, a lot of the precise methods and what they're doing might seem a bit obscure. But the article is about scientists using sediment cores taken from Antarctic research vessels to examine the size of the sediments in the core, the silt and mud, as well as to look at the isotope composition of carbonates found in the sediments. And what they found is that the sediment sizes get bigger when they look at older sediments from about 28 million years to younger sediments around 21 million years. And that indicates that the water was moving faster um, more recently. And when it moves faster, it can carry larger objects, including larger sediment. And the isotope chemistry also indicates that Antarctic bottom water, which we'll talk about in this lecture also, was beginning to form around that time as well. And that indicates that there was actually more of a deep ocean starting to form between South America and Antarctica and Drake Passage. And the estimates they come up with predate the first occurrence of glaciation documented from Antarctica. And the article supports the hypothesis that glaciers established themselves, became established in Antarctica after the formation of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. And you don't have to pick an article that's quite as dense as this, obviously, or one that's as long. But I hope you get an idea of, I think you can get a good idea of what the article is about if you start by reading the abstract and the summary, rather than attempting to dive into the whole article, and then glancing over the methods to see what physically they were working with, whether they're working with sediments as they were here, or in a different article, whether one was working with measuring ocean speed directly. Um, and then reading the entire article again after that. And I will say that if an article doesn't make sense to you at all, even after reading it a couple times and breaking it down that way, it's probably not a bad idea to pick a different article. So the Antarctic Circumpolar Current is a powerful deterrent to any other currents reaching the Antarctic. And this is important because water can store quite a bit of heat. Water has a high heat capacity and can absorb a lot of energy before its temperature changes very much. And water can carry that energy and release it to air or land where it will be felt much more strongly because air and land have much lower heat capacities. And if you look at the diagram on the above right, you can see that some of the currents are marked with red arrows and those are currents that are carrying warm water. And those are often carrying water from the equator to temperate regions. And the Gulf Stream and the Brazil Current are good examples. The Brazil Current is one that could hypothetically bring warm water to Antarctica, but the Circumpolar Current is so fast, so strong, and so consistent around the continent that it forms an imp impenetrable wall, essentially, as far as any other currents reaching Antarctica. And why don't water masses cross the Circumpolar Current? For one thing, it's moving fast. For another thing, the, there's a density difference. Now, the water in the oceans is, again, all one mass of water. But if you look a bit more closely, you find that different areas of water, whether that's between the top and surface or simply different areas at the surface, they can behave as masses, as these distinct bodies of water within the ocean that have distinct saltiness, distinct temperature, and thus a distinct density. And masses of water that have extremely different densities don't mix, don't mix along a smooth gradient. They actually occur, they actually mix in a relatively small area that is known as a front. And in Antarctica, um, the masses of water, the masses of water that meet the water in the circumpolar current mix along this front, a small zone of rapid mixing. And one of these fronts is the Antarctic Convergence. It's where water flowing from Antarctica meets, um, meets, the, cur meets the circumpolar current and where you have water from more equatorial latitudes coming towards it. And the polar water that's trapped inside of the gyre formed by the Antarctic Circumpolar Current is quite isolated and cold. It only mixes a little bit with the surrounding water and only in the narrow area right along where they meet. And the Antarctic Convergence, marked as the polar front here, is often used as the northern boundary of what Antarctica is. It encircles the whole continent and functions as a boundary. And you want to think of fronts as boundaries because they exist as a result of different densities of water mixing very ineffectively and divide very different regions of the ocean. The second half of the lecture 
we'll talk more about the concept of water masses as well. We'll talk about how water circulates from the surface to the bottom of the ocean, how that's different from surface circulation, and what it means for Antarctica. So catch me in the second half of this lecture. <laughs>